Yeah, we are a cast of thousands because we're, the sort of topic that we're looking at uh, this evening is the sort of debate about collaboration and how the notion of the master plan is kind of top down, kind of uh, singular genius creating an overview um, could be challenged. Uh, and it's, it's come about through the inspired kind of uh, client decision making of the borough of Camden and the borough of Southwark to ask uh, for these two uh, competitions originally for teams that comprised uh, many different people. Um, and so I'm just going to introduce uh, some of the team that we've got here. Uh, we've got Nick, do you want to say hello? Hi, Nick Hayhurst from Hayhurst & Co. I've uh, got Joe. Hello, yeah, Joe Morris, Morrison Company. Uh, both of whom worked on Central Summers Town. And yep. Nick also worked on Tustin, which leads me to hand over to Seth. Hi, oh, Seth Go Smith from the Dove Collective. And Akil <laughs> uh, from Resolve, uh, who have been our fantastic collaborators over at Tustin. Uh, there are other members of the team which I'll mention as uh, we go through. So, in terms of the event, we're going to just have a presentation at the beginning with uh, two short films about the projects and uh, some. Uh, presentations from the team here and then we're going to open up the conversation that we have uh, between us to some of the members of the client body who have uh, really made this project possible and who have challenged us and uh, kind of really provided the wind beneath our wings to try and realise um, the sort of aspirations that are coming together uh, and, and really I suppose both projects share this idea of common good and uh, trying to make the most of very challenging situations. So I'm going to share my screen and um, just start with one of those uh, videos. Great. Um, are you seeing my screen? Good, I'm getting thumbs up. That's fantastic. Super. Um, so first of all, we're going to just uh, talk briefly about Central Summers Town. Now, this was a competition where uh, Camden asked a very unusual thing. They asked architects to come together with teams to work on a three hectare project here shown uh, nestling between uh, St Pancras uh, and uh, Euston uh, in Summers Town. Uh, and they asked us to put together groups who could have the various skills to deliver the project. But in fact, um, to, in their wisdom, they decided to actually uh, pick and choose from different teams who'd submitted. So they actually put together this kind of uh, AF factor band, a super band to sort of um, make this project happen. So um, if we look at this, uh, you can see that we're uh, looking at this site in the middle there, a, a piece of two open spaces with a school in the middle and a community play facility and a tenants hall. The spaces were very, very down at heel uh, and um, very little used. This, the area suffers, uh, suffered uh, from real problems of the sense of not feeling safe and a general sense of uh, sort of decline and things being left dilapidated, in particular the school, uh, which was really in need of being rebuilt. Uh, there were also these areas where there was a great deal of antisocial behaviour and in our submission as the kind of urban framework architects, we said we had one simple idea which was to unite these two green spaces and make one continuous landscape that would really have a sense of duration and a journey between it. And it was with that very simple idea of the line that we were introduced to our collaborators, uh, uh, Adam Kahn, um, uh, Doug Morris, as it was then, Nick Hayhurst and Co and DRMM. And it was around this line, this sort of journey through a landscape that the three and four, five buildings kind of gathered. But we didn't have briefs for each of those buildings. They were evolving at the same time as the sort of idea of this journey through a landscape. So we were working together with uh, workshops and a lot of uh, consultation, particularly with the school, to bring about a plan where no area of public open space was lost, uh, where public space was overlooked uh, to give a sense of security, uh, where each building had its own courtyard and sense of greenery. So you have Plot 10 by Adam Kahn Architects, the community play facility and some housing. You have uh, Doug and Morris and co uh, coming across, uh, now Joe, Joe's project for housing and then the school by Nick 
and then on to more housing by Morris and Co. And then finally, at the other end of the park, close to the real metro metropolitan feel of uh, St Pancras International and the Crick, you have a residential tower uh, that is for sale and is creating a lot of the economic underscore to this project. Uh, we work together to choreograph a kind of language of doormats and a sense of welcome across the buildings as you journeyed kinetically through the space. And there was lots of to in and froing. And now you can see from the drone shots that we had this week that Adam's building, plot 10, is there realised on the left. Uh, and as we look further across to the east, we have Nick's school uh, in a state of transition. The new school built, the old school just having been demolished. And onto the Purchase Street open space, awaiting the arrival of the new housing, and in particular the tower to the extreme right of the shot, uh, next to the Crick Institute. Uh, which has just been sold to a developer by Camden and DRMM have handed over that to uh, Stiff Trevilian who have now worked up a scheme to just modify the cladding and make a few changes uh, but in essence uh, the same scheme uh, transpires. So we're just going to take you around the site very rough and ready from the Crick, from Osselton Street to the south, sorry Charlton Street to the south and from the west across uh, past the school and then back out to the crypt. Uh, so forgive me for the very shaky photography taken by one's bike, on my bike. Uh, coming under the sort of gateway entrance where the tower will sit uh, next to Cooper's Lane Estate where a new entrance and landscape has been created to guide you through there. Up through the wonderful green space of Purchase Street, uh, past new facilities and across the road to the school where you can see the match between our vision and what Nick's been producing. Then along Phoenix Road to Osselton Street, an important north-south connector here, where, which is a strong cycle route. Uh, and as we turn right here, we're looking up to the north and the school is on our right. And the new housing by Morris & Co is going to be on the left. We're then continuing further over to uh, Charlton Street. And here's the new building, uh, plot 10 seen through the railings. Uh, this foreground will not be enclosed, will not be uh, completely full of play equipment. It will be green landscape on which you can enter and play. All of these railings will be disappearing as we kind of open this up as a kind of public common. So coming from the north, these barriers are, will be coming down soon. And this vision of the continuous line and uh, shared doormat will be continuing uh, past Prop 10 and the housing. Then up towards the school again, going over to the east, where play areas uh, will be sort of mediated uh, by green space, down past the school and Morris and Co's housing. Then across between Morris and Co's housing, a community garden to be rebuilt and reprovided um, to allow the, that to continue to, to flourish on the site. And then back down towards the creek, where we're this landscaping through which we walked just earlier has a central location where there's going to be um, a large element of play where hopefully scientists and local people and local travellers will be coming together out of the park down to the south onto Brill Place where uh, a new entrance and basketball court area awaits. Over to Tustin. Uh, our collaboration here uh, as we've uh, talked about involving Hayhurst Resolve, um, but also Kennedy Woods, a young firm from Southwark. Um, Southwark actually expressed in the bid uh, for this that they wanted collaborative teams and they wanted a sort of urban framework lead, which we took, but they really wanted to see young SMEs uh, starting up in the area involved. So Kennedy Woods are people that we knew based in Peckham, uh, who've been really fantastic to work with, along with Resolve, with whom we'd never worked with either before. Uh, but we really wanted to bring Seth and Akil's fantastic um, uh, and innovative means of engagement to really sort of add some freshness to our approach. And of course, the other collaborators in all of these are the local authorities, the residents. And here we had businesses, because unlike uh, the Central Summerstown scheme, which was really about improving public space and uh, providing new public facilities along with some housing. Uh, this is an estate regeneration project at the Tustin Estate and one where obviously we have far more of an interface with existing residents. Um, so this is looking down on the site uh, coming in 
Uh, you can see this, the railway line from uh, London Bridge heading in parallel to uh, Old Kent Road. And here's the site with the three towers. It's kind of wrapped around by the regeneration area on Old Kent Road, but separate from it. And it's opposite where the new tube station will be at this location. Uh, you can see on this beautiful drone footage, which you can't see, <laughs> uh, but you can see it uh, in just these stills. It's uh, a really fantastic collection of archetypal mid 60s, late uh, early 70s uh, housing types, all centered around a wonderful green space. Uh, in the distance, you can see local green spaces to which we hope to create links, and you can see uh, Canary Wharf uh, in the distance. Our approach has been to sort of look at the scale of the individual, the household, the neighbourhood and the local area and when we did the competition uniquely we didn't come with any designs whatsoever. We said we don't know you, uh, it's a presumption to assume. We've learnt through looking at the site um, that you know it really had been the most wonderful place and indeed we had found many many residences in residents including uh, Jim Robinson here uh, who had been there uh, since the 1960s and had grown and uh, had their families there uh, but today it was really it is really in need of work and in fact on your right you can see the building work taking place as we come through from Old Kent Road towards the school on our right hand side the towers are in the midst of being refurbished at the moment so the project comprises looking at the rest of the estate, uh, its public spaces and the quality of housing that it has at the moment in terms of what, looking at options on which the residents will be voting uh, once COVID is over because uh, the process has been really stalled by uh, the pandemic. Uh, our approach was unashamedly about having conversations with people and what better way to do that than to sit down together I'm not going to talk in detail about what uh, Kennedy Woods and um, Resolve did because uh, Seth and Akil will do that. But we did have a whole host of activities that came together in things like uh, Southwark, who have run the most fantastic programme of visits to exemplar projects. Uh, Southwark have been round door to door, meeting every single resident, assessing their needs. And we've got Mike Tyrrell here who has been leading that. Uh, we've had conventional events where we've got to know people over this period of about six months. And the principles that we've come up with are very simple. Nature is at the heart of the estate along with the school, which we wish to keep. We love and enjoy the range of housing typologies. We want to improve local connectivity. And so the, three, the, the four options are maintain Tustin as it is and just uh, refurbish and, and upgrade the houses that exist. Uh, look to infill available spaces um, and uh, create a surplus on which more can be spent on those public spaces. A partial rebuild, which would include rebuilding the school at the heart of the estate, but also opening up to become more safe and more accessible, the major green space. And then finally, the sort of comprehensive rebuild of the estate, all excluding the towers, which uh, obviously have been refurbished and would remain. Um, so we had a fly through that could take you, uh, which we'll show when we give the video, uh, we'll do this for the video that um, we'll give to the AF after this. Uh, keeping the businesses on the street in option three, uh, we did this for all of the options, entering through and creating a fantastic new space uh, within it, uh, within the centre, and then connecting to the surrounding area, which is going to see the in incredible increase in density. And so on the final slide of Shay from DSDHA and Seth, uh, at one of our design team workshops. I'm going to hand over to um, Seth to talk a little bit more about that project. So apologies for the technology there. Right, cool. I'm going to try and share my screen as well. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes, good. Um, so thanks for the introdu introductions. I'm Seth and I work with my brother, Akil and Resolve Collective, and we were kind of supporting on the um, engagement side of the project, which was focused around two main elements. So firstly, engaging with the proposal, so making sure that all the residents were aware of the proposals that were going on and kind of had their opportunity to participate in that, engage in that whole process. But also um, something a bit more long-term and thinking about what kind of social value can come of this project and how might we be able to get some long-term benefits to the residents that come from the estate regeneration and, and wider. Um, so I just want to kind of talk through our approach and how we kind of how we grappled with that 
So firstly, landing in an area like this, the, the first thing that we always do is try and understand the local networks. We want to understand what's currently there, who we can work with, and how we might be able to tease out some of these kind of really valuable, but maybe not, not as well publicized um, organizations, kind of community groups, and that really, that really kind of helped our process along. Uh, this, yeah, that went okay. Uh, the second is, is building a presence. So this just means kind of doing as much as you can on the estate, making sure that people get comfortable with your face, making sure that people get familiar with your, your presence on the estate, because these are people's homes and you've got to be sensitive to that fact, but you've also got to make the effort to make sure that you're not kind of a new face every time you turn up. So that meant doing the coffee morning. So this was a, an idea that came from the other architects who are working on the engagement side, Kennedy Woods, which was we were doing the coffee mornings um, so we're doing the coffee um, afternoons, but then he was like, we may as well go outside the school and just start giving out free coffee. So we did that for about four or five weeks in a row, just to make sure that the kind of the parents and the people who surround the school, because it's such an important um, kind of, it's such an important hub within the estate, just making sure that people got familiar with us. And we'd spend the rest of the afternoon kind of going, pushing this coffee cart around the estate to make sure that we handed out coffee, gave out flyers for information and made, pe made people aware that, the drop-ins that were going on in the afternoon that they could drop by anytime they wanted and just kind of made the process a lot more or tried to make the process a lot more accessible. Um, the third thing is effort. So it's just kind of making sure that you're putting in that um, making sure you're putting that effort and making sure that that effort is visible. So yes, that it is around about engaging with a master plan and engaging with a proposal, but there are also a number of other things that people wanted to achieve throughout. One of them was a community garden. So we teamed up with one of our um, friends and colleagues called Joel de Mowbray, and he, he kind of helped us design up a community garden. We worked with one of the residents and then just um, collected a few local pallets, a few recycled pallets um, with the help of Andy Eke, who's going to be talking later, um, and just tried to put this together within one of the kind of um, green spaces within the estate. So we just made sure that anything we're going to do, we're going to be putting most all of our effort into it. Um, and this is just the community garden in progress, but unfortunately we didn't actually get to launch it because COVID shut us all down. Uh, the fourth thing is, is relationships. And this was a kind of really, really important one for us because yes, we're, we're from London, we're kind of familiar with areas around it, but we were coming very new to this area. So the, it's the relationships and kind of nurturing and building on those relationships that really helped us um, kind of helped us go go that extra mile and go a little bit further with some of the residents. So this is one of the youth workshops that we held. Um, and we didn't just hold a workshop for these group for, um, this group of kids, but we we're going to do a few other events on the estate as well. We we're going to do a cookout and a, um, a careers fair. And within these processes, we, we kind of developed relationships with a few individuals and we tried to take it beyond just a single event. So there's a woman in the middle there called Meron who we spoke with yesterday and she unfortunately can't make the call, but She's been helping us plan a lot of the events. She's been helping us do a lot of the organizing and also kind of lining us up with residents who'd like to cook, residents who'd like to share some of their skills with local people. So these relationships kind of help us take it that step further. Uh, and then finally, it's just about, and this is one of the things that we really wanted to prioritize, but it's probably the most difficult, is around um, capacity building and sustainability. So it's thinking beyond just the estate regeneration, thinking beyond. Um, kind of the proposals that are going to come out of it and thinking about what do people want to achieve and what long-term goals do people have and how might this project help some of those so we spoke about the example with Meron and she was really keen to kind of help organize a lot of these events and help link people up with these opportunities because she understands and she knows that like most people it get, it's more than just what's going to happen in this project in, in the next kind of year or two years it's about that kind of long-term support that you can give people so I think throughout the project, we were always trying to make sure that we had that um, that kind of long-term vision. And that's something that we worked at. All of the things that came before this, all of the kind of effort and building that presence and the relationships were about hopefully getting something that can, can kind of get some long-term sustainability in, and build some capacity with people within the estate. And that's that. I'll let me stop sharing. Lovely. Uh, and I will. Ooh. 
Can everybody see that? Yeah. Excellent. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the very initial kind of questions and things that we've been asking about um, uh, at the Tustin Estate, um, and then also um, kind of segue into the um, Central Summers Town um, and Edith Neville Primary School, the, the, the project that we've been doing there, um, and focusing on um, kind of two key issues, kind of one, the consultation that we've been taking uh, and doing with the community and with the school and how that fed through into the design, but also this idea of a landscape-led approach and also how this um, informs um, uh, the, the basic kind of spatial strategies, but also um, the kind of the, the tectonic um, of the building and how that gets um, kind of concluded. Um, I think one of the things that we've realized kind of doing the doing the kind of the process um, with both projects is that consultation it, it is also about these large events but it's also about a lot of smaller scale conversations um, and it's about um, and it's about not necessarily even talking about a drawing but talking about experiences talking about understandings and talking about relationships between places and spaces and actually it's those accumulation of small conversations um, which lead into so much of the kind of the intuitive um, kind of design work that takes place. Um, the school is an interesting one um, within Tustin. It sits in the centre of the estate, um, surrounded by the tower blocks um, to the south and to some kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of public open space um, to the east. Um, but also presents quite a, a quite interesting set of relationships, both from within the school um, kind of looking out and that that relationship of the boundary. Um, but then also what the relationship of the school is when seen from outside and uh, I quite liked um, the kind of the analysis of it being a, a colourful hostile barrier um, in terms of how this um, how how the school works both with the estate and how the estate um, also works um, with the school but also questioning height and this idea of actually a view beyond the estate and a view kind of um, uh, beyond the, the kind of the immediate area and this idea of um, kind of raising a sense of, of where where you're located and how that um, how that might work um, and so some of the kind of the, the initial analyses about the school have been based around kind of cultural practical and physical sets of issues um, as a starting point to begin to think about how we um, how we approach that I'm now going to kind of kind of go into um, Central Summers Town um, and Edith Neville Primary School um, and the project that we've been doing there, which it's not the same project, but there's a set of um, ideas and principles um, which you can see kind of that, that are shared between these two projects. There's also a number of differences. Um, so I think Edith Neville is a story about the, uh, the opportunity of building a new school that reaches out beyond its boundaries and provides for a specific community. It's a project about landscape, well-being and community. Um, the existing school built in the mid-70s um, uh, uh, doesn't have a great deal of street presence um, and, um, and sits behind the kind of the blue barrier um, and some fairly um, uh, kind of startling statistics um, from a few years ago um, which are probably felt more in this period than, um, than in any other. Um, so Deb has already talked about the one park approach um, as a master plan principle um, and our ideas for the manifesto for Edith Neville um, kind of talked about ideas of nature, oasis, boundary, well-being, culture, community, um, but also pedagogy and actually these sets of um, uh, what we call the manifesto um, really began to inform the educational brief as well as the spatial brief. Um, uh, and how we integrated um, uh, this for the project. But also we were really interested in this idea of a school journey and the key spatial strategies were drawn from the development of the school journey from bedroom to classroom. And how does that work on a daily basis for the children and the communities um, that are involved? Um, and, and we developed a whole series of, um, uh, of, of diagrams and conversations with the school about this idea of a family scale journey and what that means and what the drop off process is and the types of families um, that are living there and how these interactions and intersections work. Uh, but also what is it to design a school in an urban park um, relating with a kind of a key relationship with public open space. Um, and one of the key things that we did here was we put landscape first and this idea of actually rather than starting with a building and the landscape being the space around it, the landscape being the first place um, to look and actually the building is what then runs around it. Um, and then looking at entry points and actually where they should be before you even really design a building. Um, looking at this idea of oasis and entry points, looking at this idea of extending the courtyard typology of Somers Town, um, providing community access points 
but also this idea of a kind of a permeable courtyard that has a relationship to the centre of the green spaces um, and also within its design a landscape sensibility to space. Um, but also one of the key things about these projects are collaborations and this was a, a probably a late stage one early stage two um, kind of model and you can see that everything is quite blocky but it was this um, uh, Joe will probably talk about the kind of the iterative design processes and the, the number of different uh, kind of tests and models and um, that we did where we explored actually what those sets of relationships are between our different plots um, and how um, our accommodation then kind of works um, uh, to work as, a, as, a, as a relationship um, kind of between those as a cut from the um, from the Revit model kind of talking about connecting internal and external spaces but also the developing the school's elevation as a foil to the landscape um, and one of the kind of the key related kind of conversations that we had as a team was about the the, um, the different materials and the, the different characters of the different buildings and how they complemented one another. Um, we really like the idea of a filigree facade and that gives a sense of looking through trees um, and how compared to the the kind of the solid brick buildings um, uh, of, more, of, of Doug and Morris's projects, um, this idea of the lightness adjacent to the solid um, was something um, that we that we thought was really interesting. Um, but also looking at it, kind of how the, the direct connections kind of worked, and then also kind of folding the kind of the the elevation of the project into, and if you put landscape to elevation, wrapping around three sides, how does that work? Um, and also how do you then build that layered elevation? Um, so providing a sense of security for the children within the school, but also a sense of permeability and filigree kind of uh, character from outside of the school. And this idea of the boundary then became almost like a piece of sculpture, sculpture within landscape. This idea that there are trees back and forth and there is this kind of piece that sits in. Um, and then when unfolded, you can see how that hopefully kind of begins to work. Um, we did a whole number of the kind of the, in terms of the act of collaborating and the act of looking at landscape in terms of buildings that appear and disappear um, kind of within the landscape context. Um, but then also internally spaces were seen as an extension of the adjacent landscape with strategic kind of views out. So this idea of then also folding the insides out and then rather than sports halls being closed rooms, actually sports hall are open spaces where you can begin to see um, the local buildings and the local character and people can identify where they live. Um, and then also just on the ground, um, some of the kind of the, the, the doormats and the landscape connections between us and one of the, our entry point here and some of um, uh, Doug and Morris's housings and how that, that character and that landscape um, kind of work together. Um, and then one of, I think one, one of the most successful inter intersections is the pupil entrance um, and one of the other uh, blocks to the housing which was pulled back. Um, and this idea of a, I think it's a nine storey residential block that slightly tapers back to open up to the single storey kind of pupil entrance and celebrating um, those kind of sets of connections. And those sets of threads and connections from people's plots um, were a really rich kind of element um, of those projects. Um, uh, the project's currently on site in the landscape um, and you can see this idea of the sculpture and landscape beginning to emerge um, and the insides are complete um, but haven't been properly and fully occupied yet because of um, that current situation. Okay, all right. Uh, Joe, I think it's over to you. I will stop sharing. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Uh, where are we? Uh, sorry, I can't seem to find my presentation. There it is. Okay. Um, everybody can see that? Yeah. Okay, can I? Which is good. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Nick. So, um, my aim um, is to give a rapid sense, uh, I guess, with the time that we've got left now uh, from the technical glitches of what aspects of the project emerge through the team ethic of um, uh, continuous peer review, the close stewardship of Camden's own design and housing officers and the continuous feedback loop gained through the engagement events. Um, we can see here that there were seven plots which were defined uh, through a, a landscape threading between them. Uh, and my practice worked on uh, three of those uh, clustered forms, delivering uh, 64 homes, uh, roughly split as 50-50 um, across affordable and market tenures. Um, as Nick has sort of said, uh, the scheme 
uh, very much emerged from first principles with no predetermined pattern book and by a process of continuous iteration by all parties whilst interfacing and interacting with each other. Thus, in some ways, we were a kind of multi-headed client, multi-headed team and a complex community seeking to create a deep network of relationships and place-centric responses to a range of specific site issues and programmatic ambitions. Uh, the team worked collaboratively and closely in a form of co-design, uh, which challenged methods, assumptions, and the language uh, as the scheme evolved. Um, thus, project uh, is unique, we believe, in a way. Uh, it's in uh, projects in which the landscape was the lead in the process, uh, where instead of it being an afterthought, uh, its program very much directed uh, the plot designs. Thus, open and responsive uh, processes resulted in buildings which were not willful, but efficiently designed, echoing their internal arrangements within the landscape framework and contributing to their local uh, 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 settings, um, which we deem to be a predominant domestic. And thus, we feel the project uniquely follows uh, the uh, contoured layer of the land, which contained open space, play space, pathways, planting and trees. And the ingredients of the project which emerged included uh, the activation of the corners by the organization of the new homes to bring animation and passive surveillance to the surrounding landscape. Um, and a close bond forged between the housing, uh, I guess, and the community facilities, uh, which defined each other symbiotically. In this case, a community building and a play space by Adam Khan on the left, uh, with its sort of unique uh, idiosyncratic roof profiles and the tour of the housing elements by Morrison Company, nine stories completing the block, or this one, um, uh, which was the kind of important reprovision of the community garden framed by our new lower rise housing buildings of ground plus two and ground plus five story uh, dwellings. And thus, these were all uh, through this process, through this en engagement, both in terms of observation, discussion, dialogue, and the continuous peer review ended in buildings um, forging uh, or, or completing the grain, complementing um, and completing broken building patterns and to frame essential uh, community space. And through the building the process, um, uh, 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 kind of emerged clusters of complementary characters with identifiable entrance sequences, which were unique to each, fostering a sense of identity and ownership. And where the interface between the public and private territories are clear, legible and safe and ensuring a qualitative sense of place which are replete with uh, new spaces for people to come together to exchange and interact both within their community as well as beyond and as the framework emerged with plots and buildings gradually sort of settling in place and the framework becoming more concrete and clear we continued to seek forms and a kind of language which local residents could relate to which were evident in our analysis and discussions in the round which are not alien, but familiar and playful and resulting in a scheme which we have uh, sort of collectively aimed to be, which is rooted uh, in its place. And I shall stop sharing there. Thanks, Joe. Um, at this point, we were hoping to show the video, weren't we, Seth? But I don't think we're going to risk that. Um, I don't know if you want to maybe, if we kick off and sort of talk um, about sort of working with the community and you, you work with Meron and what did you manage to ha uh, elicit any interesting insights today just ask this process of asking for feedback um, and how things have gone um, one of the things that she did mention which was quite interesting was um, a need a greater need for advertising and kind of um, one of the bits of feedback that she gave was we were doing a lot of things and we were making a lot of efforts for a lot of different people but um, maybe there could have been a bit of attention on or a bit more attention on advertising especially for young people um, which is some one of those things that is extremely difficult and we like to work with young people and it's one of the one of the things that gives us a lot of joy but we also think is really valuable for processes like these but um, I guess it's just it's one of the challenges working on um, different est estates working in different areas I think one of the challenges just, is just kind of putting yourself out there and making sure that everyone has access to the, to the right types of information that will bring them in as well. Um, because we sent out a lot of flyers, we sent out a lot of different things, but you know, a kind of invitation for a, for a drop in on an, off, on an afternoon might not entice a young person. But um, other than that, it was a really positive conversation and we were just talking about 
how we're going to move forward in this in this new world. So are you thinking about the next step post COVID? I mean, we're, we're just starting that conversation, aren't we? Do you think social media should play a role? Uh, we will see. We will see. Mm. Very good. Well, we're, we're lucky enough to have Andrew Eke here. I don't know if Andrew can turn on his uh, microphone because it'd be good to get Andrew's um, view as a both a resident and your chair of the residents project group, which was a fantastic initiative set up by Southwark to make sure that the residents are really playing a huge role in the appointment of the team. That And before we were involved, um, the writing of a manifesto of, of core um, beliefs that have really shaped the brief. So I'm just wondering if Andrew wanted to mention that, so come back on that. Yeah, thanks uh, for inviting me and thanks for putting this together. Um, yeah, so how, how have you been finding it in your role, you know, caught between the different interests uh, and also working with multi-headed architects rather than just one company? You know, maybe bring your, bring your insights. I must be honest and say the process has been quite uh, brilliant, but the only snag we've had are the architects, you know? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, just to, you know, I'm going to start with um, f from where Seth left off when he was uh, discussing the interaction with the residents and um, where their wishes are changing you know, with the youth, uh, with the parents wanting something for their children and the younger folks on the estate. So um, that's everything. I mean, what I always say to everyone is at this stage in the process, you know, we have to decide uh, the architects are designing a um, model for that will benefit the estate. So that's the first protocol and what Mike's team are doing around housing needs is going to inform the tie how uh, younger folks are going to engage. And moving on from that, you notice that one of the things that's happened since uh, all the models that you've kind of developed, people are gravitating towards that center point where you've got the open ground, you know, like the green area. I think Deborah first brought that up, you know, and a lot of people are resonating with that. And that is one of the things that is bringing a lot of people into the conversation. You know, for me personally, uh, it's been a long time coming and I'm kind of very, very keen to see how, uh, how well the architects have actually maintained um, uh, the, the resolve throughout dealing with different personalities on the estate. It hasn't been easy, you know, keeping everybody engaged, you know. Um, and one thing that stands out for me most of all is how all, I mean, the, the, all, the whole team managed to get everyone relaxed. It doesn't matter, you, you know, for me, it's very difficult on this estate to get people to negotiate, I mean, to interact with you. But from the get-go, even before the selection, you know, uh, common ground we've been, and this is not me, this is me talking from what I've seen and from experience, you know, negotiating a lot of things in, the, in, my, other, in my other job. Uh, getting people relaxed to come out of their shell and talk to you be comfortable. What are the, you know, with all the suspicions in the world, you understand? You know, it hasn't been easy. You, you know, there is a lot of suspicion that, oh, what, what are they after? You know, they are more relaxed around the around common ground than they than around the council. You know, they open up more. So and that's helped to generate the kind of uh, participation that we've had. Then marrying that with what uh, Mike Tyrrell's team from Ledbury are doing. So we kind of, I think, in my view, have a uh, winning uh, model, uh, yeah, a platform to go forward. So do you Bringing COVID into it, sorry, you were gonna say? I was gonna say, we can hear from Mike in a minute, if you wanna just- Yeah, so as far as uh, COVID is concerned, you know, since the lockdown, um, Yes, uh, Maron told me what happened yesterday. Um, 
you know, they, she's quite in, uh, keen to, and some of the uh, young parents on the estate are quite keen to engage with uh, Seth and Akil, uh, common ground with whatever project, because people just want something to do. And this is one of those outlets that is like God sent. You know, uh, you, you can only have so much 30 minutes in a week, you know, so with the uh, return of common ground and potential engagement again, people are just kind of breathing a big sigh of relief. You know, as for me, I'm recharged and I'm ready to roll. Fantastic. What about you, Mike? Seth, do you want to lead a conversation with Mike? That's you're going to be my stunt double, Akil. <laughs> Come on, Akil. Oh, there he is. Oh, can't hear you. Um, yeah, just stepping in as a stunt double for Seth. So what, um, what's been the difference uh, for Suvik in working with this team? And, uh, and like, how does that make a difference? For us, it had to make a difference. What we had to do at Suvik was make sure we got a team involved that would work so well with the residents. This is a totally new approach by Southwark um, because of problems with regeneration schemes in the past. And we wanted it to really be resident driven. Uh, that's why, you know, we're shortly, hopefully, once uh, we can ease lock down a little bit, go into a situation whereby uh, we're going to work with residents to whittle down the options uh, for a voting, for a ballot, yeah, the, uh, the residents have worked up uh, with, with the whole of the team and um, so that the residents will make the choice of which option goes forward to a final ballot and uh, we're really really keen it has to be resident led mm. and for me I'm quite surprised every time and I, I often say it to the, the, the different members of the team I talk to after we've had a public meeting or after we've had a resident project group I can't believe I'm, I'm thanking the architects so much because they really have listened to the residents. Um, they, now, I'm talking to a load of architects. I don't know if it's news to you, but sometimes architects can be very precious about their work. Um, but the team have taken it all on board where the resident feedback has said, we like that, but can you change this? Can you change that? And that's the kind of architects that residents need to work with. And I work with residents on, on a, uh, different projects, both in Southwark and in Tower Hamlets. And... That's what I love about the team we're working with here. They really are listening to the residents and amending the options as, as the residents have asked for. And as, uh, as an officer for the council, I can't ask for much more because that's exactly what we wanted for this scheme. Yeah. Oh, thank you, uh, Michael. I think all the um, nasty architects around the table are, are blushing at the moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, I should say this for clarification. I showed a mug, a picture of a mug that said Common Grounds on, and that was our collective name uh, that the group of architects had that we uh, dreamt up on the spur of the moment with our coffee, uh, our coffee uh, cart initiative. Um, so that's the, the term to which people are referring. I mean, is, is it worth talking about some of the challenges that we've had on either of the projects, uh, Summerstown or at... Um, at uh, Tustin. I mean, I know for a start, we, we, there was an image that Nick showed early on of um, a wonderful shop space. We, we originally did want to have a shop, didn't we? But um, we had to change our plans. I don't know if anybody wants to contribute on that and how we kind of had to deal with that. Seth? That's doing again. Is this for, for Tustin? Um... Yeah, I guess that was when we originally we wanted to use a space that was quite front facing um, and use a space that could kind of be quite accessible to the estate. Um, and luckily, there's a row of shops that lead that kind of front um, end Tustin. And we saw that one of them was available and we thought that we might be able to use it for the engagement sessions. But then because of a few kind of complications with, um, with uh, the current occupants, we got we got put into a new TRA hall, which it's a it was on its current it was kind of under construction, and b it was in a it, because of that it was in a position that people weren't necessarily as familiar with, so I think that presented us with a challenge because we had to really try and make we had to basically sign put put signs all around the estate. 
to try and show people exactly where this office was. Um, and that, you know, was kind of no one's, no one's fault and no one predicted it, but it just created a kind of quite a big challenge for, I know for Akil, myself, Tom, because it was the middle of November, you know, we were doing sessions from three till seven. It gets dark about four, five. And by the time it's dark, it's really difficult to kind of approach people and, and encourage people to go into a space that they're not familiar with. So I think that was, yeah. And that's something that you're always going to find when you're trying to build a bit of a presence on, um, on an estate on a, within a community is that you've, um, you've got to take into account little things like that. Just to add to, um, to that as well, I think as much as, um, as much as it's always the silver bullet to try and have that central hub, like that shop space was very much going to be, um, the way in which we'll be able to have a local presence and a continued one. Um, I think what it, that prompted the team to do is to think more kind of networking. So really what we ended up doing was utilising existing spaces. So we'd, we'd be playing football in the park and that's how we get in contact with young people. Uh, we were in the square a lot when we were doing the coffee in, um, morning. Seth already talked about how we kind of activated that space purely through the presence of a shopping cart um, and, and, and coffee. And also just the, the, the presentations from the entire team collectively being in the school, which is already a familiar ground. So it's often not the case that you need to go and reinvent the wheel or boil the ocean um, to, to bring people to a space. And it's about kind of reutilizing and re-understanding existing spaces in order to do that. What about you, Nick? On um, so you've worked on both projects. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are there are there are marked similarities, but also marked differences um, between the two projects. Um, you know, with Central Summers Town. Um, there wasn't a, a constituent resident community. We were creating new homes um, uh, and new school and, and um, or a redevelopment for school and community facilities. Um, but with Tustin, um, we're looking at the potential of, of changing people's homes and, uh, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a different task and a different ask. Um, and I think, but with both of them, the challenge is how to get um, to the breadth of the community. And I think there's a tendency um, within consultation programs that you end up listening to those that shout the loudest rather than and they don't necessarily represent the largest constituent um, of the people um, who live or work or use those particular spaces around them um, and I think with both projects um, there's a level of um, it's, it's not necessarily just responding it's actually interpreting um, uh, and how those kind of um, and how those voices and how those communities and actively seeking out um, uh, the, the, the quieter kind of smaller conversations you know in the same way that at Central Summers Town we had the market stall um, on Charlton Street which enabled a one-to-one -one conversation impromptu a bit like the coffee spaces that we've had at, at, at Tustin so I think it's the it's it's the it's the it's the interpreting rather than necessarily just responding um, to um, yeah I think one, one of the things we thought that was an interesting aspect in both projects was um, the pressure of time I mean, in terms of learning, um, that uh, I think we, as a team on both projects, we kind of wanted to have time to uh, discover the unwritten brief, as Muff call it, Liza Field calls it, on the projects. But uh, in both instances, we were, because of funding mechanisms, et cetera, we were sort of kind of compressed into quite tight um, time frame. So it's, it's, it's trying to almost make, moments of calm amongst this haste to get towards the deadlines etc that actually allows space for those uh, conversations to happen um i don't know if anybody else would like to offer any other questions or commentaries on where we've got to so far feel free to contribute <laughs> deborah can i ask something just about um just i would like to hear from the architects really about their your feelings about um well, put it this way, 40 years ago, Camden might have um, asked Lloyd Neve Brown or Benson Forsyth to undertake the entirety of this site. How do you feel about the expectation um, that, that this is going to be a, a piece of the city of this size is necessarily going to be designed by multiple architects? Um, I guess, I mean, Deborah, you've been involved previously in the Olympic Village for example, where maybe it's much more of a monolithic building type, ultimately, you're working with there. But there's, again, this sort of expectation that um, many, there will be many different expressions. Um, in the 60s, you say the Barbican, you know, is an example of 
one architect undertaking a piece of city of that size. Do you think we've completely seen the end of that that kind of model of urban development that one architect might be entrusted with um, developing a you know a multi-use building with you know going over more than one building plot? I think that's a really good question. I, I certainly I think having worked on the Olympic Village, it was our first ever housing scheme, uh, being thrust around at the table with something like um, 18 men and myself, <laughs> uh, you know, and it was always called uh, Deborah's building. And I was like, it's not Deborah's building. It was all very sort of, it was, it, it was uh, different male characters. It was very sort of top down kind of, we're building this kind of, uh, really sort of uh, almost like military sort of mi mimic the military and I found it really uncomfortable uh, and we had a master planner who set guidelines and I was told my building could only behave within these guidelines and um, I think the result is something that had potential to flourish but perhaps didn't take wings I was constantly being taken one side to one side and saying DSDHA are about to get sacked because we kept breaking the rules. Literally, we were going to be sacked for breaking the rules. I mean, it's a bit of city. It should be by multiple hands. Um, whereas I think here, what we had was, um, and maybe it's, yeah, I think nowadays we want to have multiple voices. We've got to have multiple voices. It's, I don't know what others think. How, how was it for you? I mean, we, we were, the, I was the sort of, I was the kind of lead in terms of on, on um, Central Summers Town. I, I was the one who was, in charge rather like today in sort of drawing conversations to a conclusion where we could agree what the next step was but I don't know did I boss you guys around was it militaristic you definitely you definitely bossed us around don't you? yes but, um, uh, no, well, I mean I think what I was going to say on um, because what's interesting about both projects is that they're both um, they're both collaborations um, uh, um, I mean, they're structured slightly differently, but one of the interesting things about Central Summers Town, and that was the first time that we'd done a, a collaboration on, on this scale, um, was that um, is that was the um, the uh, kind of the equity or the parity between the way in which each practice approached working with each other, um, and I don't think it ever felt um, um, I don't think it ever felt as though there was a a master and you had to do this and you had to do that, and it was. What, what surprised me was the was the genuine sense of the sharing of that conversation um and, but it also challenged your own working methods um and um i, I remember um, kind of having having conversations back in our office about um about model making and about um kind of the distances between buildings and things like that and, and there was a level of conversation that we wouldn't necessarily have if it was just doing our own building um, but because it was a, it was a kind of a, a it was a constant three-dimensional negotiation um, between those um, between those things. There's, there's something much richer in that collaboration, and I think for the better. Is there any others from the team want to step in and answer, Joe? Yeah, I guess I guess for me, I mean, it's a really interesting point you're making, Alice. Um, and I guess it's it's in some respects it's quite difficult with sort of contemporary practice to. To answer it fully because I've never known any other system uh, other than the system that I'm working within which is becoming I think as, as has been uh, evidenced by this project increasingly rich through the dialogue and through the debate um, and I guess one thing that sort of springs to mind just thinking about you know this particular project and projects that we're working on where the hand of the many is evident within the kind of you know the output and the richness is should it ever be uh, uh, should there ever be a kind of place where one hand dictates the form, the grain, uh, the appearance, uh, and the typology of any given city anymore. Um, and there are many examples where that is a failure. Um, and obviously there are examples of, of, of um, states where it's kind of celebrated and rejoiced. And equally, uh, in the world of um, collaboration and kinship and celebration of richness, there are failings and there are strengths. Uh, I hope that something like um, Central Summers Town, certainly the one that we're working on, uh, the, the thing which is successful is exactly everything that we're saying, that, you know, we didn't come to this with a kind of pre-hatched um, or pre-baked framework. It, it evolved, uh, con you know, continuously and, and in parallel with the plot testing. There wasn't a sort of before and after, it was continuous process. And so all of the decisions which were made through the hands of the many and through the richness of the background and thinking sort of fit together without it being a sort of monotone uh, or monoculture uh, of ideas. And I think that's got to, that has to be applauded. 
Yeah, I think having the landscape as the main player on the on the site is is a really uh, important. And it's interesting that that's emerged, like Andrew was saying, as as something that people can relate to in Tustin as well. Uh, at the end of the day, you want to make a bit of city that is shared through its public space and that's where people can act out their lives and share their sense of connection with other people uh, and in a way uh, the buildings at central Somerstown and hopefully at tustin eventually would be would be background buildings against which life takes place rather than maybe some of the more heroic works that you know the ones that you mentioned So I don't know if there are other questions people would like to come forward with or remarks. Well, I think you guys have touched on it a little bit, but we're, we're um, working on something with Joe actually in, in Peckham. And um, there's been lots of talk uh, about how to do some further engagement work. And I just wondered if maybe it's a question for Seth uh, or, or the rest of the architect team, how, how you would uh, begin to do that in lockdown and whether there are you gave some great tips, Seth, your, your points one to five, but imagine starting that um, without physically really being able to engage with people. It's just a concern I have about how we're going to actually start doing this, beginning uh, to do it whilst in lockdown on the back foot. What kind of uh, things might you think about doing to try and um, make that engagement engaging? And particularly, you mentioned perhaps younger people who are less um interested in leaflets and flyers and meetings and maybe more interested in like online engagement or something like that um, so we've this is something that we have like been coming across for the last couple of months and we've there's two approaches that i think would be effective um both one that we've tested and one that we're trying to test and the first is is kind of re reverting online and trying to develop something that so we developed a platform. We've got a project in Croydon where we're helping for a master plan and we developed a platform that is around um, collecting people's memories and stories and kind of um, that qualitative information about an area. Um, and that it almost takes, that almost takes um, the place of this early engagement phase because we, ne we didn't get a chance to actually do that. So we have the only connections that we have with the area are, are kind of, um, the contacts that Corydon have given us or the, con the contacts that the, the council have given us because we weren't able to go on the ground. So you've had to kind of start from zero with this platform. Um, and we've tried to encourage people to almost take like a really like early phase engagement approach with the master plan, with, um, with the master plan through that platform. But then we're going to have to rely on, especially if we want to work with young people, we're going to have to rely on some of the local businesses, some of the local organisations to, to frame it a bit better and to make sure that we can kind of frame it in a way that is accessible for them. So we're not just um, asking them to upload a, a picture or a photo in the same way that we might, but so that it's, it, there's something in it for them, essentially. So that's something that's currently yeah. underway. Um, and then I think I've seen, like, I've seen a lot of examples of the, kind of the power of the notice board and the, you know, the power of, of these types of seemingly quite old school forms of engagement where people have essentially left up um, it might be a sign, it might be a leaflet, it might be a kind of a table and a few paper and pieces of paper where people can access it in their own time. And you can start to build that information up over time and you give people a reason to leave their house um, and to kind of to have a little understanding on what's going on and then they can return and then more people can add to this. And um, so there's been a few examples of that going around and I think that is the direction that we would like to head in for that piece of work. So we've, we've started online. And then we try, we'd like to try and land in people's areas in a very um, kind of light touch, light touch way. Don't know if, kid, if I've missed anything out. Yeah, I like the idea of um, what we've been talking about is maybe trying to create um, akin to a listening project. So collating stories and um, allowing people somewhere to record their stories and then have that accessible is something we've been thinking about that doesn't, that often happens in these conversations that you, you guys seem to have a really successful way of engaging with people face to face and having those little mini conversations. It's quite hard to replicate that online, but an idea of a listening project where we record people talking about their lives is, is something that I think could be really interesting. Uh, so, excuse me, can I come in there for a second? Please, yeah. Yeah, um, what we, yeah, because uh, 
that's another area that we thought we could uh, find an improvement on. Uh, we could support uh, the efforts Common Ground were uh, in trying to reach people. So going forward, what we trialed when we started the major works for the three towers was when we were testing the material for the cladding, um, we had a video session on um, that was quite successful. People engaged with, it, with that. So why was it successful? Because it was available when they had time, not the time that you, know, you had the open day. So people had that flexibility. So one of the things we want to do now, um, we've kind of saw some uh, digital devices, is that we're going to create, use uh, the TA hole, uh, turn that into a hub of sorts and have multiple uh, you know, laptops and computers so that people can go online and check some of this information because it's already there. Huh? You know, but having that capacity to look, you know, to, to interact with it was a challenge for people, you know, especially when they don't have support. Because when you leave it to people to go and do check the information out online or visit the website itself, they don't. You know, they only rely on word of mouth. But when you do have uh, somebody uh, uh, in attendance who can actually navigate the website for them we find that uh, a lot of our people kind of engage more so in, in that light that's one of the things that we want to help in supporting uh, the engagement process when we remobilize you know so i don't know if that will help because there's a lot of work going on and there's a lot of information that's been gathered but i get a lot of, i get on average about six calls a day you know <laughs> run by the same thing and I have to keep re-explaining to people, you know. So, but if I can, if we can learn anything from what's happened with the face-to-face, -face, I think this this way would also supplement all the efforts. Great, thank you.